Ladies and gentlemen, if you can please help me give a warm welcome to Mr. David Wood. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, folks. This is a huge pleasure for me to be here. I uh, really appreciate you coming out tonight. Um, we're going to talk about something called moral injury, and I will explain that um, as we go along. I, 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 I kind of shy away from the idea of giving a lecture. I think of this more as a conversation because I want to hear from you folks, and especially I want to hear your pushback on some of the ideas I'm going to be talking about tonight. So get ready with your questions. Also, notice that the, um, the, the white paper that's on your chair, you get a chance to rate my lecture. So if you could give me a five, I pay a dollar a point. So if you give me a five, um, you, can, you can deduct that from the cost of the book. So one thing um, that you should know at the outset was that I grew up in a Quaker family in a little suburb of New York, uh, a very um, white, middle class, safe environment. And when, so when I was growing up, we didn't know anybody in the military. But we were pretty sure if we did know anybody in the military, we wouldn't like them. It was that kind of environment. And so, um, you know, I went to Sunday meeting and did that whole kind of thing. And when I was about, I guess, about 10, we had one of the Hiroshima maidens come stay with us. So these were women who'd been schoolgirls at the time of the atomic blast. <clears throat> and around about 1955 or so, as I remember, uh, and I would have been 10, they came, they were brought to the US for plastic surgery. And one of them stayed in our house for a couple of weeks. So the first person I knew who had any experience at war was not a military person in a fine uniform with medals or cool weapons or anything like that. It was, it was a person that my country had tried to incinerate as a schoolgirl. So that's the environment that I grew up in. And then I became a journalist, and I, through a series of accidents, which I could talk about later on, I became a war correspondent. I went to Africa for Time Magazine, and I covered all the wars that were going on across the continent in the late 1970s. So I did that for four years. And by the way, I, you know, they sent me out there with no, I, I didn't know how to be a war correspondent. I didn't know that you had to know how to be a war correspondent. I just went. So I didn't have any training or any special equipment or nothing like that. I just went and through the kindness of strangers skated through that experience okay. But it was kind of eye-opening for me. I was a conscientious objector during the Vietnam War and pretty well convinced that I knew um, that morality lay in not taking part in war. And then I came across lots of situations where innocent people were being killed and it really changed my world outlook. Anyway, I came back from that experience uh, to Washington, and I started covering the Pentagon. So I was a Pentagon reporter, which meant that I traveled everywhere with SecDef and went to all the briefings and budget hearings and stuff like that. And after about two years, I was like, God, I can't stand this anymore. And then I thought, wait a second. You know, you guys are out there all the time doing cool stuff. So I called up the Army and I said, I'm really bored. I want to go out and, you know, out in the field with you guys. And they said, okay, send us a list of questions you want to ask. I was like, I just want to learn what you do. So I called the Marines and they said, oh, we have this exercise going on. If you want to go, here's the home phone number of the company commander. So I called him up. He was a little surprised. He said, yeah, if you want to go along, be here at this such and such a time. And so I went. So starting about 1980. 82 or 83, I started spending a lot of time out in the field, uh, basically with ground combat troops, because they're the easiest to embed with. And um, it was a great experience, and I learned a lot. I embedded also with air crews, and I've embedded on Navy ships, Battleship New Jersey, for a week. That was pretty unique. Um, submarines and bombers, and I pretty much spent the last two or three decades out in the field with the military, what, what I find fondly called the working class military. And the sort of centerpiece of that whole 
uh, body of work that I was doing was in 1992 and 93, I embedded for a year with the Marine Battalion because I felt like, you know, I would go out and spend two, three, four weeks with a with a, an infantry company, but I didn't really get to know what, you know, I didn't really get it. So I spent that year with the Marines. So this was the first battalion, second Marines, and they were part of the Marine Expeditionary Unit, 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit. So we trained up for six months at Camp Lejeune, and then we went sailing out into the world for six months. And we went to Somalia and did that whole thing right before Black Hawk Down. Um, that was pretty interesting. The thing that really struck me about that experience was, for the first time, I really got this thing called camaraderie, which is such a weak kind of word. Um, you know, to me, it looked like unconditional devotion to each other, which is a pretty cool thing. And so I wrote a book after that experience because, frankly, there were a lot of things I wanted to talk about that you couldn't put in a family newspaper. And so I wrote the book and. The Marine Corps hated the book, and the Marines loved it uh, because it sort of told what you know what this is really like. But the name of the book was "A Sense of Values," because I could see really clearly that what held this group of people together, who were as divergent, as diverse as you can possibly imagine, was this central core of values that wasn't just something that they you know tacked up on the bulletin board. These were values that they acted on in small ways every day and that really were the really were the central part of their you know of their lives that was a real wake up call for me cuz you know even as a reporter having covered the military then for what 10 years um, i hadn't really gotten that before so that was kind of interesting and so all along this period when I was spending a lot of time out in the field with the troops, um, gradual transformation for me, right? From a Quaker conscientious objector kid to, um, so I started to think, you know, I really like these people. And I, you know, I have to admit, when I was around them, I stood up a little straighter, cut my hair a little shorter when I had hair, um, said sir and ma'am, <laughs> which puzzled my mother. Um, and I came to see that, you know, that the reason I was doing this, that my sort of my self-imposed mission was to, because I had come to really like the people I was writing about, and, I, and every time I went home, people didn't have a clue. I went once to a, a dinner in Georgetown, you know, the typical Washington, movers and shakers are at the, around this dinner. And, um, and I think I'd just come back from Fort Polk or National Training Center. I was talking about the, the, you know, the really hard, tough, realistic training that they were doing. And this matron who was there said, in a tone of disgust, why would you train for war? I was like, OK, I got my work cut out for me here. Um, so I took it on myself to, to start focusing my reporting on talking about who is it that we send out to fight our wars? And why do they go? And what do they do when they're there? And what's that like? And how do they think about that? And where do they go to the bathroom? What do they eat? All that kind of stuff because you know, I could tell, I know that most of my neighbors and most of the people in this country, like me when I was growing up, didn't know anybody in the military. So, and when there were wars, I went. So I covered all the wars that, you know, everywhere. And, um, and when there were no wars, I hung out with the troops. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I want to talk about a, a, an embed I did in particular, one particular embed. And by the way, when I, does everybody know what I'm talking about when I say embedding? So basically what that means is, for somebody like me who's been doing it a long time, I think, you know, the 3rd Brigade of the 10th Mountain is going to be at an interesting place. I kind of like their commander. I want to embed with those guys. So I called them up and we'd, you know, sort of arrange it and then I'd fix it up through DOD. And, um, and I would be authorized, I would be given travel orders and it was all, you know, stamped and cool and everything like that. 
Um, and typically what I would do is I would go, you know, train with the unit that was deploying so that I got to know them and they got to know me so I wouldn't show up in Afghanistan a total stranger. Um, and then we'd fly over there and, and, uh, and then I'd spend a couple of months there with them. And I had um, a satellite phone and my laptop, which I didn't bring, but a real lightweight, so I carried everything in a rucksack and I just went where they did and ate what they did and slept where they did and, and wrote down what I was seeing and what they were talking about. So that's the embed. Um, by the way, I just want to make a note. I, I was thinking, you know, I've been up here at the War College a lot, and during the 1980s and I think into the 90s, um, I used to come up for military and media day, where we would, a bunch of reporters would come up from Washington and then we'd argue with the military guys. And there was this whole thing about how, um, which I heard pretty often, was how the press had lost the Vietnam War. And, and we were accusing the military people of being secretive and not letting us in, see what they were doing. And, and it was pretty acrimonious. Um, so thank, thank goodness things have calmed down now. And now, you know, for the, um, during the 90s and up until today, it's been fairly easy for reporters to embed. So we have a whole generation or two generations of reporters who are used to living with the troops. Yay, this is good, this is great. Um, so I embedded um, with the 1st Battalion, 6 Marines uh, who are going to Afghanistan and going to a Helmand province. And the reason I embedded with them was because they were the battalion landing team for the 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit. The guys that I went to Somalia with back in 92, 93. So all different people and different battalion and everything like that. But I thought it was kind of cool, you know, um, just to see the differences. And, and so, I, so I trained with them at Camp Lejeune, and then we flew over to Afghanistan, and I spent a couple of months with them there. The reason why I'm telling you this is because I want to talk in particular about one of the Marines that I've gotten to know. I got to know pretty well there. and have seen a lot of him since. So this kid's name is Nick Rudolph. And Nick Rudolph is out of the Marine Corps now. He's a nice kid. I'm sorry if I call them kids, but you know what I mean. They seem like kids to me. So he was, when we were in Afghanistan, he was probably 21, maybe 22. Californian kid, so kind of laid back, uh, blonde hair, kind of goofy, you know, but a really nice kid. So one day, this was in Marja, or just outside of Marja in Helmand Province, there was a firefight. And it was a pretty typical situation where Taliban are holed up in this adobe farm compound, you know, and Marines are trying to advance on them and there's a firefight going on. And, and at some point, Nick sees somebody coming around the corner of the building, shooting at him and his Marines. And he gets that person in his sights and realizes that's a 10-year-old kid, shoots him dead. So in, in that situation, that was the tactically correct thing to do, right? Um, legally, it was a good kill, because, you know, complied with all the land, laws of land warfare, the Geneva Conventions, which don't say anything about, you know, there's an age, <laughs> you know, you have to be a certain age to be a combatant. It's like, you know, when you get on a, Carnival ride, you know, you have to be so tall. Um, nothing like that. Um, so 10-year-old kid, that's okay to kill him. And you could even say it was morally correct, right? Because Nick Rudolph is protecting the people he loves most in the world. You know, that unconditional devotion to each other. He's protecting them. And so it was like split second. Then he comes home. And Nick Rudolph is a kid who killed a child. And he says to me, what kind of person kills a child? You know, it's interesting. Um, since that happened, I've run into several people who've been in the exact same situation where they're killing a woman or a child that's sort of 
tactically and legally correct, but morally repugnant. And they got to make a decision like that. And the thing is, we send them out there into these situations with no preparation. So Nick, no idea how to deal with this situation. Um, it turns out that, there, that this is a very, very common phenomenon. So <laughs> I, I always have this experience where I run into somebody from the military and they say, what have you been doing? And I say, well, I've been writing about moral injury. And they're like, whoa, moral injury? You know, is that like the, you know, the left wing press accusing us of being baby killers? And I'm like, no, it's more complicated than that. And here's what it is. And, they're, and inevitably, they're like, oh, yeah, I've had, ex let me tell you about the experience I've had. And it's like everywhere you look, it's moral injury. So how could this be? I spent a lot of time asking people about this. And we send people to war armed with a huge amount of moral understanding, a sense of values. You know, it's stuff that we learn from our parents, it's stuff that we learn at church and synagogue, mosque, it's stuff we learn at school, stuff we learn on the street, you know, you don't hit a girl. And then you come into the military and there's a whole nother layer of values that are imposed on you. And, you know, like I said, this is stuff that people and you know this better than I do, live by those moral codes every day in small ways over and over hundreds of times a day, right? And that's the utter, you know, the, the unthinking devotion to each other. Not unthinking, but spontaneous devotion to each other. And does that mean killing a child? Yeah, it does. So we put people in these situations and it's not that the values are wrong. The values are great. It's those values which enable people to, to persevere in the most difficult circumstances in combat, right? But you cannot live up to those values all the time in, in combat, in wartime. You can't do it. So for example, um, I know a guy who was a company commander, special forces, and um, he was in Afghanistan, and he got a call one day saying, hey, um, there's this village about 100 clicks from where you are. That's uh, a friendly village, but the Taliban came over, came and took over the town, and we need you to go get it back, to kick the Taliban out. So I was like, okay. So they went to take a look at it, and they were like, town is full of women and children and Taliban. How are we going to do this? He was like, you know, so he and his guys are standing back thinking, hmm, tough problem. We could go in there, we could just go in and start shooting, and we'd get the Taliban, but we'd take pretty significant casualties. Or, you know, we could pull back, call in indirect fires, and kill a lot of people. That's what they did. They called in indirect fires, airstrikes, artillery, and they killed a lot of people. And the next morning, they went down into the village. Taliban were gone, dead or fled. And um, they watched people throwing the bodies of women and children in the back of trucks. So the company commander who's telling me this story is just absolutely devastated. So how does he feel? How does he think about this? He's angry. He's ashamed, he feels guilty that he killed all these women and children. He did, he made the decision. He's angry because the army or higher put him in that position where he had to decide, lose my men or lose women and children, one or the other, binary choice. And he feels betrayed because he conceived of his military service as a noble cause and this was not noble. So there's moral injury. Um, lots of other examples. I know a, a, a combat, um, a trauma, I think they're called a trauma, me, tra trauma medic. He's the guy on the helicopter when they do a Kazovac, and he's 
like trying to keep the guy alive in the 12 minutes until they get to uh, the medical facility. And this guy was telling me there was a guy I couldn't save. And he said, you know, and he described the scene. He's on, on his hands and knees in the chopper, which is bucking and swaying, and he's trying to keep this guy alive. I don't know exactly what he was doing, but he lost him. And I think it was a situation where the guy was so badly wounded that if he'd been wounded in the, you know, in the surgical bay of the best trauma hospital in the world, he, they couldn't save him. I mean, it was that kind of situation. But, you know, this medic now, seven or eight years after this event, burst into tears telling me this story because the guilt you know, I fucked up. I, I, there's something I, you know, I screwed up. I didn't do it right. I could have saved him if I'd just been a little better trained, if I tried this, and just beating himself up like that. <sighs> Moral injury. So let me mention PTSD, because I've spent a lot of time also with PTSD, trying to understand it and writing about it, talking to people that have it. Um, PTSD is like a, it's like a, it's like a mechanical response, you know, fight or flight. You're in danger and, you know, your hormones pour into your bloodstream and everything starts going like this. And, and that's great in, you know, in emergency situations, but at Walmart, not so great. And so that's PTSD. And I, I don't mean to make light of it. I know people that have it. It's bad, and, but it's not moral injury. Moral injury is something different. So this um, army... Um, company commander I was telling you about, the trauma medic, Nick Rudolph, they don't have PTSD, you know. They don't startle. They don't, you know, they don't have those kind of symptoms. What they have is sorrow and grief and shame and guilt, not because they did something wrong. You know, it's worse than that. It's like, in many cases, self-blame. Like, you know, you have a a fire team that's out on, or a squad out on patrol, and a sniper kills one of the soldiers or Marines. And everybody in that squad was like, I failed him, you know, I screwed up, I should have seen that. I should have seen that sniper, I could have prevented it if I'd just been a little more, you know, alert. Or, and I know several people who've been in this situation, um, you know, a staff sergeant or a company first sergeant or something like that, IED, loses a leg, sent home, racked with guilt. Why? He left his guys there and they're not going to do as well because he's not there to help them. And you know, they talked to guys at Walter Reed when Walter Reed was full of people like this, sadly, and every one of them is trying to get out of there and get back to you know their guys. You get this, right? I mean, it's like it's this devotion to each other that's so powerful that that's what makes this whole thing work, but it's also so personally painful, you know? I thought about this a lot. I use the word love to describe that bond between or among people in, in, in combat units like that. And, you know, the thing about love is you're going to lose that person you love. You know, whether, you know, it's your wife and she dies eventually of old age, or, or, you know, the guys in your squad, do you come back and, you know, everybody disperses and all of a sudden the people you love most in the world are gone. It's another moral injury. You're like, you know, these are my support people. I depended on them and I was taking care of them. And what am I, what do I do now? I'm, I'm totally lost. It's another moral injury. Um, I had meant to read you something because I spent so much time with grunts that most of what I know about moral injury comes from them. But I want to read you something that, um, that will maybe broaden this out a little bit more. So if you'll just bear with me. Quote, war is vile. There are some things that are more vile, and that's why we fight. But that vileness affects you down to your core, David Sutherland once told me. I'm sure some of you know David Sutherland. 
Uh, a soldier for 30 years, Sutherland commanded the 12,000 men and women of the 3rd Brigade Combat Team Task Force of the 1st Cav Division. For 15 months in 2006 and 2007 in Iraq, they fought day and night. Sutherland had vowed to personally honor every one of his badly wounded and dead troops, and he did that, visiting hospitals and morgues, putting his hand on the body bag or head of each one and praying. It nearly broke him. Quote, guilt, shame, sorrow, bereavement, normal human reactions, but as a commander, I couldn't shut down. I was in a battle every single day. I'd wake up to an IED exploding and go to bed with an IED exploding. Close quote. Staff Sergeant Donnie D. Dixon was part of Sutherland's security detail as they traveled the battlefields, and on September 29, 2007, Dixon was shot and killed. He was 37 and left a wife and four children. Quote, when Sergeant Dixon was killed, that affected all 17 members of my security de detachment, Sutherland said, and some of us more than others. We were standing right by him when it happened. How do you not believe this is a moral injury? So Sutherland went on to be, um, the I think he was the mental health advisor for Mike Mullen when he was chairman. And, um, you know, a, a good guy who was, who was still deeply affected by those kinds of experiences of moral injury. So I, I think we define moral injury. It's, it's a violation of your sense of values, right? Um, you know, we all think of ourselves as a good person who do good things, and good things happen to us. And then we go to war and those kinds of things don't happen. And we find ourselves in morally ambiguous situations and, and from which there is no good moral answer. And so the reason why I started to tell you about, <laughs> sorry, I know what I'm talking about. I hope you can follow me. I, when I started to talk about the guys that I went to Marja with, um, 1st Battalion, 6th Marines, um, is because it was then that I started to figure out, wait a second, you know, all these guys who I really like, and my guys, by the way, I mean women, and there are women in the book that I talk about, um, they're not okay. They're coming home, and there's something, I can't really put my finger on it. It's not PTSD. I don't know what it is. And slowly, I, with the help of people who are smarter than I have, figured out it's moral injury and violation of their sense of what's right. And the more I started to talk to people about it, the more I could see that this is virtually, I think, a universal experience of war. And, you know, like any injury, moral injury could be, you know, like a physical injury can range from, you know, like hangnail to quadruple traumatic amputation. You know, and I think most of the people I know who've experienced moral injury, they're either in the middle or sort of to the less severe side. Nick Rudolph is not damaged. He's not, you know, he's okay. You know, he's, you'd never know, unless you'd been to Afghanistan with him, you'd never know that, um, you know, that he's carrying around this burden, sort of like a stone in your shoe. You know, he will carry that burden of being a child killer, in his, his words, um, forever, for the rest of his life. And <laughs> the last time I saw him, we went to dinner with him and his girlfriend. Really nice kids. They're not kids anymore. They're growing up. But, you know, then we, took, we dropped his girlfriend at home, and we're driving back to his house, and he said, you know, do you think that I should tell my wife my girlfriend about this because if we get married and she wants to have kids if she knew I had killed a child would she ever trust me with our kids that's the kind of thing that Nick Rudolph carries around with him I don't know how he's going to answer that actually I do know <laughs> his story's in the book she's going to read the book and go oh you know um 
so I want to leave a lot of time for questions, and I'm about to wrap up here. But um, one of the things that I wondered was, so what do we do with this? You know, we now we know. I mean, it's it's pretty obvious. Moral injury is out there. We know what it is. It's undeniable, except by the Defense Department, which doesn't want to have anything to do with moral injury, which I don't really understand, because you know. You guys train young kids relentlessly and beautifully, and, and it's superb, realistic, tough, hard training. And I've been through a lot of it. But you don't train them to meet moral injury. This is a huge problem. You know, if somebody had sat down with Nick and his buddies and said, look, bad shit is going to happen. Let's talk about how to deal with it. No, no really good answers, but here's what you could expect. And here's maybe some things you can think about to process through this. Because we want you to be whole and well. Because we need you out there doing your job. I mean, this is, not, this is not Sunday school stuff. This is just practical stuff. But at least the last time I checked, the Defense Department doesn't want to have anything to do with moral injury. There were a couple of... Two, I know, small experiments that had to do with training people to recognize, to anticipate moral injury, and to figure out ways to deal with it. And they were both squashed. Um, the VA does recognize moral injury. And that's great. You know, it, There's a tiny little place on the website. They try to hide it, but it's there. And there are a couple of VA medical centers that are doing really interesting therapy for um, moral injury. But that's after they already got it, you know? <laughs> it's too late then. You know, guys like Nick Rudolph, he's never going to go to the VA for a moral injury, you know, repair group. Not Nick. He, you know. um, so I thought long and hard about, OK, so what do we do with this? And I want to I leave two thoughts with you. One is. We got to press the Defense Department to recognize moral injury and to, and to um, include it in the training at every level. You know, we need to, we, you guys need to, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be telling you what you need to do, okay? So, it, in my view, it would be nice if, like, staff sergeants were trained to recognize moral injury guys who are suffering from it, like Nick Rudolph, and to step in and say, you know, we can get you some help, or let me help you think about this or talk through it or whatever. Because when Nick Rudolph killed that child, what happened? And this is so typical. The firefight moved on. The Taliban fled. Kid's body was left lying in the dust. And, you know, the Marines went and chased the Taliban on down the road. And that's pretty typical. You know, these situations occur so quickly, as I'm sure you know, it's like, it's like you know, a thunderstorm at night, lightning flashes, it lights up the landscape for a split second, then it's gone. And you have these experiences at war that are like that. They happen, they're like cataclysmic, and then they're gone, and you're on to something else, and there's no time to really think about what, what was it that just happened? You know, how do I think about that? So. Five years after this happened, I, <laughs> I called up a bunch of these Marines. I said, hey, let's have a beer party. You know, I miss you guys. And um, so I rented a couple of hotel rooms in Philadelphia, and, and they brought a lot of beer. Oh, my god. And uh, so for a whole weekend, we sat around and drank beer, and they told stories, and I just let my tape recorder run. And, um, and it was during one of those two days that I said to Nick, hey, Tell me about the time you shot that kid, because I'm a little fuzzy on the details, and I can't remember exactly how that went down and, and how that affected you. So Nick told the story. And five, so five years later, he's like head down, choked up, long silences while he struggled to regain his voice. And when he finished, there was this long silence. And I wanted to 
I wanted to find some words of comfort, you know? I wanted to say, you know, it was a long time ago, don't worry about it. You shouldn't be obsessing about it. You couldn't help it. It was the kid's fault, not yours. And all these sort of weasel words that, that Nick had already, you know, long since rejected. And then from the shadows, one of the Marines spoke up with what I've come to think of as the perfect response. And what he said was, yeah, that was fucked up. I thought, that's perfect. It was fucked up. And notice that there's, you know, there's no blame attached. It's not like you fucked up or the kid fucked up. It just was. And it's a discrete event that happened in the past, right? And we're still here, we're still your buddies, and we love you. And it doesn't make any difference about how we think about you. I mean, it's really a perfect response. So not long ago, I was giving a talk about this subject at a church. This was in Rhode Island. <laughs> it was a big church, and there were, I don't know, five or 600 people there. I mean, it was jammed. And these were, these were peace groups. So <laughs> this is an audience already primed to you know, go, yeah, moral injury, we got that. And I, and I was running through this story about Nick Rudolph, and I got to this Sunday afternoon in Philadelphia in a hotel room, and one of the Marines said, and I suddenly thought, uh-oh, can I say it? I was like, what the heck? Yeah, that was fucked up. And there was this gasp, silence, and then people just burst out laughing and clapped because it's perfect, right? I mean, it really, it, it's what the experts call listening with validation, which means, yeah, we hear you. We get it. You know, we're still here. And that's really at the heart of a lot of the therapies that the VA and other people were trying out with moral injury, which is, you know, when I was learning about all this, it suddenly struck me. I understand why veterans come home and they never talked about what happened. You know, it's almost a cliche. You know, grandpa came home from the war and never talked about what he did. And after he died, the family goes up to the attic and opens up this box that is full of medals, you know, and they never knew. They never knew. But, you know, think about Nick Rudolph. How could he tell people who weren't there what he did? Because chances are they'll go, oh my God, you killed a child? How awful, how could you? Well, that's not the response. <laughs> it's not a great helpful response. But listening with validation is. And so, um, as I started to say a few minutes ago, I want to leave you with two ideas. One is pressing the Defense Department to recognize moral injury and get on the stick about at least talking about this in basic training and, and introducing this into all the great training they do at the National Training Center in Fort Polk and all those places. Because it's really important that we not send kids out unarmed against this problem. And the second thing is for the rest of us, and this is really why I wrote the book, part of my mission to educate the, <laughs> the American people, um, there's a conspiracy of silence, I think, about war in this country. And we like, when I say we, I'm talking about us civilians, right? We like to think that war can be antiseptic, that we don't kill civilians. Come on, you know, when there's all that stuff flying through the air, civilians are gonna get killed. No way around it. And we, you know, it's good that we try to minimize it and everything, but that's war. It's, Bad stuff happens in war. Um, and part of that is to deny the cost of killing. You know, um, I got to know a VA psychiatrist named Shira McGinn, who works at the um, San Francisco uh, VA Medical Center. She's done a lot of really precise, peer-reviewed research on killing. And you know, to sum up her lifetime work in a couple of sentences, um, basically what she's found was that, that killing, even in a just war, in a tactically correct, like Nick Rudolph, everything, you know, done well, killing imposes a cost on the killer. And what she found was that the act of taking another human life um, raises the likelihood of the killer having significant mental health problems later on in life, like significantly. 
And we don't account for that. We don't even tell kids, you know, at boot camp and basic training, this is part of what you signed up for. And I think that we civilians are complicit in this sort of silence. And I want to encourage people to try to turn this around by talking to veterans and asking, you know, can you share a little bit of your story? Because I want to understand what it is that we ask you to do. Because, and I feel really strongly about this, in this country, it's supposed to work that, that we vote on whether to send people to war or not. And OK, it's an imperfect system. And basically, people take a pass and just say, well, you know, I don't really understand. The military knows what it's doing. And so whatever they think, you know, if we should send more people to Afghanistan, I'm sure there are good reasons. And I, you know, I don't want to be involved in it, uh, even though I admire the military and I like them and everything. That's not good enough. You know, and you know, think back two, two years maybe when we were talking about sending more troops to Syria and the phrase boots on the ground became popular. You know, everything was bog, boots on the ground. And I, every time I heard that, I said, no, American kids on the ground. That's what we're talking about here. But there's this sort of, we don't want to think about it. And especially about the moral implications of war. We don't want to think about it, but we, we owe it to the kids that we're sending to war to do that. All right, I've talked enough. Um, I'm instructed to tell you if you have questions or if you have pushbacks or you have stories you want to share or anything, you've got to talk to the mic. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful talk. We'll start with uh, questions and answers. Uh, we got one right there in the front to start off with. Thank you. I have a two-part question. One is, do you think that the moral injury gets masked by the PTSD? Okay. That's number one. And the second part, does one begin, does one beget the other? Do you start off with the moral injury and end with PTSD or vice versa? You need to ask a scientific, a medical person about this. But my observation, and again, I get this from hanging out with grunts, so take it with a grain of salt. But PTSD is a very specific thing, and it has very specific symptoms, and, and, and there's very specific treatment for it. You know, moral injury is it's, it's much more amorphous, and it has to do with your own sense of values, right? Um, I th in my experience, it's more common for someone to have a devastating physical wound and PTSD than it is to have PTSD and moral injury. Although, you know, I'm very aware that, um, so when I, when I spent a year um, at Walter Reed and some other places getting to know the severely wounded, um, I, ne I never asked them about moral injury because I didn't know about it. And I don't think anybody else did either. So what we know is not very much. But I do know that their PTSD and moral injury are very, very different, very distinct, although they share a couple of symptoms, you know, like sorrow and grief and depression. All right, we have one right over here. Uh, I enjoyed the audio version of your book. I like the, um, I really enjoyed the audio version of your book and the uh, Nick Rudolph Christmas tree story I liked a lot. Um, you mentioned uh, two authors I enjoyed, um, that I learned a lot from rather, uh, Shea, uh, the Odyssey and the Achilles books, and uh, Grossman, I think you mentioned. And I was wondering if there was any other uh, books you can recommend, or if they're in your book, I only got about 95% through. So if they're in the back, then, then you, that sort of answers my question. There is a, uh, a bibliography in the back. Uh, mostly it's scientific papers, uh, which I found interesting and instructive and sort of halfway understood. So <laughs> I put those uh, in a bibliography. Um, those, are the, those are the two. But here's the interesting thing, you know, if you, Go back, so I have a whole collection of war books. Uh, people have written poetry and, 
and remembrances of wars going back to the Civil War and, and further back to the Revolutionary War. And people wrote a lot about it. And if you, you know, it, once you've got moral injury in your mind and you read some of this stuff, you go like, whoa. Um, you know, this is a common thread that runs through war literature back to Homer. Homer wrote about this stuff. You know, it's in the Bible. You know, actually, this reminds me, this is not a very good answer to your question, but it reminds me of something I wanted to say, and that is that um, going back to the days of Homer and societies knew how to deal with moral injury. You know, they knew how to deal with killing, and the way they dealt with it was to say, you know, if you go to war, you can't come back into civilian society until you've gone through cleansing and, and forgiveness. So, like, the Battle of Hastings, 1066, <laughs> the bishops had this list of things, you know, it was like a Chinese menu. If, if you killed between zero and 15 people, you had to do a certain number of days of penance, and you had to wear a hair shirt, and you had to crawl up the, the uh, aisle of the cathedral and, and all this kind of stuff. But if you killed between 15 and 40, you had to do X number of things. And if you didn't know how many people you killed, you had to do penance for like your whole life. I mean, it was all written down there, and you weren't allowed back into polite society until you atoned for what was considered the sin of killing. So I, I don't really sign up to that, and I don't, I, the whole idea of forgiveness, I'm not really comfortable with, because you know, when you think about Nick Rudolph, what do we have to forgive, except that we sent him out there without really being prepared. But, we, but for having killed that child, who am I to forgive him? That just seems weird, so I don't know about that. But, but this idea of cleansing, is so important. We don't have anything like that. You know, Nick Rudolph and his buddies all came back from Afghanistan, and you know, six weeks later they were at a keg party, smoking dope, and that was it. And no, no acknowledgement or anything. So that's a loss. But like I said, all you know, a thread running through all the war literature that I've read, you you can find it there. We have one on the other side there. Hi, I don't have a question, but I uh, just want to tell you there are people working on this at some levels. I myself am a volunteer with hospice in a program that the VA sponsors, Vet to Vet. And we will talk to veterans at their end of life, and they often have things they want to clear up. They want to get off their soul, as you put it. Things that their families say they never heard from them. Uh, and we don't, we don't push them, we just listen. So there are people in some level working on it. How do you respond, you know, when, if, you know, like in my experience, fairly common when somebody wants to talk about something horrific they did, like they tortured prisoners or something, how, how do you respond? Just that I understand what they're saying. I, I'm not a confessor. Yeah. I'm not a, even a psychologist of any kind, but I let them speak, and that often is very valuable. Thank you for doing that. That's great. It's good to hear. All right, we have another one over here. Uh, is the military, are they looking at moral injury as a possible, uh, a major stepping stone to suicide? Is that a question? Yes. You know, here's the thing. I've studied the whole phenomenon of veteran suicide, and I, the more I study it, the more I think that we don't really understand it. Um, because a lot of times, you know, people take their own lives and don't leave. We don't really know why they did it. But I can't help but think that some of the people that I've known with moral injury, like severe moral injury, uh, like that company commander I was talking about that leveled the town in Afghanistan. You know, I mean, he feels abandoned, betrayed, and hopeless. That sounds to me like um, it could lead to suicide. So, I, you know, there's so much we don't know about this. It's really frustrating. 
No, we have one here back in. Oh, back. Uh, back in the late 70s, did a lot of research here on the Korean War, Chosen Reservoir, and then down to National Archives and all sorts of places, Truman Library, everywhere. Then I went out and interviewed people that were in at the reservoir, military, you know, Air Force, et cetera. And I've just reviewed all my tapes, I got them all transcribed. And I was, you talk about them not people not talking about the war. What I found was that uh, if you're gonna talk to somebody, because I, I, I've listened to these tapes since, they, I think they have to realize that you're more interested <laughs> in this than they are. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I mean, you can't fake it. I mean, you just literally have to be more interested than they are. Because these people, will they will talk, but you can't have a one-sided conversation. You want to talk to somebody about Afghanistan, and you don't know anything about it, well, you're not going to be able to draw, you're not going to be able to ask questions, draw it, give them any information, et cetera. I found they wanted to know stuff, too. That, that's all I'm saying is if you want to really talk to people, and, I'm, and you do, obviously, but do you have that feeling that you're more interested in this than, than they are? I mean, because that's the way it got, and you, they will talk. But to come home to a family, and another thing too, history, you know, that's history to you, but to them, it's not really history. I remember in high school, it was in the 50s, we would learn about the U.S. history up through World War One, It took a long time for me to realize that these teachers, I'm not gonna tell you anything about the Depression or World War II or something, because to them, to them that's not history. They're wondering how, you don't know, you know, what the hell. Yeah, good point, good. People do wanna talk, but they're afraid, you know. So it's a matter of breaking that. It's tough. All right, we have one back here in the back. All right, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I agree with you. I think there's always more that we can do to help train young men and women mentally and psychologically. I'm really curious from your perspective as a war correspondent, um, how do you view the, the media, the media's role in helping the situation? And how do you think things like TV shows and movies and video games, does that help or hurt? Next question. <laughs> Um, so thanks for the question. That's a good hard one, and I could talk for hours about the media. But um, I don't think it helps because it sort of popularized the notion that that war can be highly technical and antiseptic and and uh, and mechanistic, and when it's really you know a totally human endeavor, and 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 it, you know there's a cost. There's there damage happens to people. Um, at the same time, you know, there are there are a number of really good pieces of deep reporting about all this. Um, you know, I'm thinking of a book by David Finkel called The Good Soldiers. Um, there's some short stories that capture this a lot, but but when you're talking about mass media, I think not has not been helpful. Yeah. Right over there. Thank you. Um, my name is Benef Varel. I'm retired Army, and I'm also on the board of directors with Warriors at Ease. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, and you had mentioned about pressing DOD, and I find that the organization is just so large that one way that we like to um, get make commanders aware is more of a grassroots approach. So would you be interested in helping us with this, um, getting in front of commanders and discussing moral injury, because I, I don't know that that's uh, one of the issues that we're discussing. We certainly talk a lot about PTSD and TBI and um, adaptive yoga for people missing limbs, but I don't know that uh, anyone's talking about moral injury, or if they are, it's not to scale. But I, 
I mean, we've got a presence, especially uh, with 25th ID in Hawaii, um, able to sit at their division commander's roundtable. And so I just, I mean, it would be a start to get the discussion happening. You know, if there's anything I can do to help, I'll, I'll give you my card and give me a call. Um, I'm in the process of moving from Washington to San Antonio, but they have airplanes, so I could do that. Um, I did work with, uh, there's in Fayetteville, right outside of Fort Bragg, there's a Quaker house. There's a bunch of Quakers in Fayetteville. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> uh, and they were working with the chaplains at, um, at Fort Bragg to try to do a workshop on moral injury. And everybody was really excited about it, and it was scheduled and everything. And finally, the Army was like, not going to happen. They were forbidden to do that. So that's the kind of, and that was probably two years ago, maybe, yeah, two years ago. Um, so maybe things have opened up a little bit more since then, but the, but the, the, the uh, you know, big army's official stance is hostility to the idea of moral injury. But, you know, like I say, if there's anything I could do to help, I'd be happy to. We have one right over here. It seems that the uh, way to prevent moral injury would be, or inoculate against moral injury, would be to the mindless, uh, vigorously uh, inculcating the mindless ideology uh, would render one immune. And so have you considered the prospects of people who are immune to moral, moral injury uh, and would that, you know, as, as the saying goes, it's a good thing that war is horrible lest we grow too fond of it. Yeah. Uh, so have you considered uh, those people who are not vulnerable to moral injury? It's an interesting question which I wrestled with when I was doing the reporting for this book. And um, I did think, wait a minute, do we really want to... Oh, I know it was when I was talking to... a somebody at DOD and I was arguing with them about why they should have you know, some kind of training. And they said, well, maybe we should harden people a bit about, against moral injury. And I was like, whoa, no, we don't want to harden people. But then I thought, well, what is it that we want to do? And um, so that, I think that is a, you know, there is a risk. The other thing I want to say is that in the course of my reporting, I wanted, when I was writing a chapter on killing, I wanted to find that guy who was impervious to moral injury, somebody who loved killing, was good at it, and just did a lot, a lot of killing. And I found him. He's in the book. And he came and sat in my house for a couple of days, and we just talked nonstop. And I came to see that even this guy, hugely damaged by the killing he'd done. In fact, in the book, he says, you know, he had an epiphany because he was back from his umpty ump tour in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he sat down to write about all the things they'd accomplished, and he was like, we killed all these people, and what did it change? It got worse. Something's not working here, and so it, he sort of flipped around and, and looked for other ways to affect, you know, affect the war, but uh, he's also just plagued with, I mean, he's a mess. He's a wreck. And he was a pure killer. So maybe there no, maybe it's people aren't impervious to it. I don't know. I, I also wrote in a book about, um, I was at Fort Benning one time. This was a long time ago. And I was walking around with a guy who'd been, did m multiple tours in uh, Vietnam as a, I think he was a ranger. And, um, you know, so we were walking around and he was like, <laughs> great field of fire over here. You know, I put machine guns here, and, you know, and he was describing this as a tactical environment. He was retired. And, um, I, and then he mentioned something about Vietnam. And I said, have you ever been back? And he goes, yeah, I, I went back. Um, walked the battlefield with Viet Cong commanders. And I said, how was that? And he was like, interesting. I said, in what way? And he goes, well, we were walking along one day. We came up over a rise, and there was a, this huge field of white crosses. And as he was telling me this, and this guy was a hard, 
you know, hard combat soldier, started to cry. And he said, all those people we killed, you know, we shouldn't have done that. All those people, tears running down his cheeks. <laughs> it, it was, you know. So I don't, you know, I question whether there are people who are impervious to it. I don't know. But it's a good question. This is really a follow-on to the last question. I just phrased a little different way. And I think it's perhaps the, the dilemma of the preparation. How do we train soldiers to kill and not make them killers? And to the extent that we succeed in training a man to kill and to kill aggressively and not become a killer, I'm not sure there's any way that we can avoid uh, just having to help them deal with moral injury. Yeah, that's a good point. And the way I thought about that is if we at least told them the moral risks and taught them to anticipate being in morally ambiguous situations and how to think about those and how to think about it immediately afterwards so that they don't walk around like Nick Rudolph thinking I'm a child killer and having really nobody to talk to or no way to, nobody to help him think about, you know, that whole situation. I don't, you know, I mean, I don't think we can not train people to kill. I think that's, you know. Um, do we want them to kill unthinkingly or unfeelingly? Probably not. But this whole idea of righteous warfare, you know, I think there is such a thing. And, you know, like Sutherland was telling me, war is vile, but there's some things that are more vile, and that's why we fight. That's okay. So I think there are ways around that problem that you mentioned. And, you know, look, there are smarter people than me who should be thinking about this, and maybe they are. But I don't think it does anybody a service to send kids out to train them to kill and not prepare them for the consequences. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay, so, right, so there was um, um, a guy at West Point whose name I'm going to forget, somebody remind me if you know him, Peter uh, Kilmer. Kilmer, thank you, Kilmer. thank you, -E -E right, Kilmer, Peter Kilmer, uh, who did develop a training module um, for the Army that addresses exactly this point. And as I remember, the cartoonish version of what he was proposing was that e each one of us walks around in a, in a bubble, in a, yeah, in a bubble, and that protects us from being attacked by other people. But if you're a bad person, if you do something evil, your bubble disappears, and then you can kill that person righteously. I mean, it's it's a cartoonish version of a fairly sophisticated training program that he devised in order to address exactly your point, which is, you know, can you both teach someone to kill and hold the moral high ground at the same time? And he very much thinks you can. That's one of the things that the Army, you know, said, we're not going to do that. But it was an interesting approach, and I think speaks to your your question, which is, can, is there a way to do that? Maybe there is. All right. In other words, the whole, the whole notion of righteous killing, right? Just war and righteous killing. It's complicated. You know, I, mean, I came to think the whole idea of just war was baloney. That for grunts on the battlefield, it's, you know, pointless. That's another evening. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one more question right here. 
Hey, sir, uh, thank you for your interesting dis um, discussion this evening. But I got to challenge you on your comment that uh, DOD doesn't do anything regarding this. Um, all the units I've been in that have prepared to go to combat discuss this thoroughly. Um, and uh, perhaps some people don't absorb the discussions, but uh, there are always discussions about the morality of war, what you're going to face when you go into combat, what, uh, what challenges you, you're going to be expected to uh, face, uh, not just with the enemy, but also with civilians, um, and uh, what may happen. And, uh, uh, of course, nobody before they go knows exactly what's going to happen to them and to their unit and, and where they're going to be and wh what, how that's going to play out. But I think that uh, to at least some extent, um, any good leader um, in, a, in a unit, any good commander is going to try to explain to the soldiers what they are going to go through. So is this, can I just ask you about that? Because this is really interesting and I didn't know this. Is this something that the, like the battalion commander would do on his own or is this a DOD program? I can only program? talk to you about my experiences at, at uh, battalion level and below, yes. All right, thank you for sharing that. I'd, I'd like to know more about it.